Okay, that's what happened. I thought the booster and the nutshell. We always kid about it. Yeah, it's like, in the that was three months ago. Guys, try to hijack the skin. Stick shit. Yeah, they jump back out. The booster and the. Yeah, it's like, that's 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 like, I'm glad everyone's feeling good tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get started here. Um, all right, uh, I'm Leo Sarley. I'm not chairing this committee. I'm temporarily chairing this until Sarah can make it. She's the official chair. But um, so I'm pinch hitting tonight and Karen was under the weather. So with that little side remark aside, uh, we will now start with our preemptive sort of Typical conversation that we have at the beginning of every meeting. So if you can stay quiet for the recording sake, and then we'll do introductions, have the presentations, and get into discussion. So uh, welcome everybody to the April 15, 2024 Site Plan Review Committee subgroup meeting with the NSTA Site Plan Project. We will be holding the hybrid public meeting, uh, which enables remote electronic participation that's legally authorized by the Coalition the Planning Commission's electronic meeting policy adopted on July 7, 2022. Members of the FPRC subgroup for the NSC project are participating both here and in person, uh, and in, in here in person and virtually through electronic means. At this time, I'd like to orient everyone to our hybrid environment and cover a few specifics about how tonight's meeting will run. Members of the public may attend a meeting here in person or electronically by using the Microsoft Teams link provided on SPRC webpage, the project webpage, the county's events calendar and the email notification sent to SPRC email subscribers. Additionally, there is a dial-in phone option for those who wish to use it. For our subgroup members joining virtually, if anyone loses internet connectivity during today's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. Please keep your phones and devices muted until you are called upon. Turn off sound to any other devices around you to minimize interference. For our virtual attendees using Microsoft Teams, please turn off your video feed. I will address when it is appropriate to turn it on in a moment. Microsoft Teams meeting chat is active to serve two purposes, the SPRC subgroup members who need technical assistance and for members of the public to add their names to the list of public comment, which will be taken at the end of the meeting. The Teams chat should not be used for discussion. Those who are planning to provide public comment will still need to do so at the end of the meeting as the chat will not serve as that opportunity. Our public comments must be shared verbally for the record during the assigned public comment period. If the subgroup members participating virtually wish to be recognized to speak on an item during the course of the meeting, please turn your video feed and raise the virtual hand and key. I will monitor the video feeds that are on as an indicator of who, will like, who would like to speak. If subgroup members are participating by the phone today without the video option, please announce your name and group you are presenting now, and I will verbally check in to see if you wish to be recognized as you do not have the video feed option. Do we have any phone callers? We have one phone. Are you a member of the um, SPRC? All right, we'll assume they're not. Uh, for our members of the public who wish to like to provide feedback and comment, you'll be called on to speak at the end of the meeting and will be allotted two mm -hmm. minutes to speak on tonight's agenda item. The speaking time allotted will depend on the number of speakers we have this evening. If you wish to speak, please enter your name in the meeting chat to virtual attendees or provide staff with your name if in person, and you will be added to the speaker's list. Lastly, this is a public forum. Today's meeting will be recorded and posted to the county website. All information associated with today's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to the Freedom of Information Act requirement. Okay, with that, again, I'm Leo Sarley with the Planning Commission, and I will go counterclockwise today. John Armstrong, Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Rolfus from Clonin Village 2. Stuart Stein from Lake Farm, rather from My High Civic Association. Terry Prell, North Rosslyn Civic Association. Ann Wong, I'm the president of the Bromptons HOA. Steve Smith, Cooper Carey. Alicia Buck, Cooper Carey. Andrew Painter with Walsh Colucci. Gordon Riley with Walsh Colucci. Brian Eskew, Ford's Companies. Chris Slatt, Transportation Commission. Jim Lantelli, Planning Commission. Hugh Bagley, Planning Commission. 
Let's take our head seat, just me. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant Birkachea, Development Services Bureau under DES. Uh, Courtney Badger, planner with uh, Community Housing Development. Peter Schultz, Community Housing Development. Joy and Gabor, DES. Great. Anyone online that we need to acknowledge? Oh, Kenley. Hi, Kenley Peterson, Planning Commission. And we do have some STLC members. Hi, Leo. I'm uh, Caroline Haynes with the Forestry and Natural Resource Commission. Elizabeth Troll is on the line. Okay. Disability advisory team. Yes. Oh, or was. Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> Looks like we might also have Commissioner Guevara on this. Commissioner Guevara, would you like to? That's you. <laughs> 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 Yes, but I can barely speak, so. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. That's Commissioner Karen Guevara with the Planning Commission. Um, I think that's it then. No one else? Is there any staff online? No. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming, and I will hand it over to staff to start with the presentation. Thank you. Let me take just a minute to pick it up here. Um, but there's a little bit of lags. Okay, there we go. So good evening, I'm Courtney Badger again. Um, I'm a planner with Arlington County. Um, and tonight, Sergio and my colleague and I are gonna be giving a staff presentation on this project. We're gonna be talking about the policy guidance that we're reviewing this project with, um, and then highlighting topics around the agenda, transportation, construction, and community benefits in particular to talk about. Um, so just to reorient everybody to the site and fresh your memories, um, this site is the, the square site outlined in white here. It's located between Wilson and Clarendon Boulevard adjacent to North Road Street. And the applicant is proposing to um, demolish the existing NSTA office building Roadside Grill and Illudico restaurants and construct a new seven story mixed use building containing 188 dwelling units with ground floor retail. So, with that, I'm going to pause and turn it over to Sergio to talk about transportation. Thanks, Courtney. Um, in terms of transportation, I'll start off with the applicant's proposal on sidewalk and streetscape improvements surrounding the building. Consistent with plans and policy guidance for this area, the site is proposing sidewalk widths meeting standards recommendation. The site will provide a total streetscape width of 16 feet and 8 inches along Clarendon and Wilson Boulevard, as well as North Road Street. For all sidewalks, the site is proposing a minimum of 8 foot clear and a 4 to 5 foot wide tree. In SPRC number one, there was a concern about the stoops approaching the clear sidewalk, the stoops being those on Clarendon Boulevard that are highlighted on the left. Staff recommendation was to maintain an eight foot clear sidewalk. Since then, the applicant has worked with the county staff on achieving that eight foot clear width by narrowing the tree pits on Clarendon Boulevard from five feet to four feet. Though their width is a foot under the street tree recommendations, its length is double that of the recommendation. Um, while the redesign may not be optimal for trees, it will allow for a continuous clear sidewalk on all three sides of the building. And just for clarification, the applicant has provided the eight foot clear sidewalk. However, the old tree pits were five by 12, and the proposed ones are now four by 16. Staff will continue to work with the applicant to see if there's another optimal solution for this area uh, by the proposed suit. Moving from the streetscape to the to the roadway, the site is proposing a 43 foot wide um, street cross section from face of curb to face of curb on Clarendon Boulevard, which will comprise of two eastbound travel lanes, two parking lanes, one on each side of the roadway, and one eastbound protected bike lane. 
This proposed width will allow for enhanced bike lanes and will be consistent with other street sections further west of the site, such as the Wendy site, and that is delivering also eastbound potential bike lanes. On Wilson Boulevard, the site is maintaining the 43 foot street section, which includes two westbound travel lanes, two parking lanes, one on each side of the roadway, and a protected bike lane treatment with the bike lane and buffer on the north side of Wilson Boulevard. Lastly, on North Road Street, the site is providing a 55 foot street cross section, which is the same width presented at SPRC number one. From the online engagement, staff flag members comments regarding enhanced bike facilities on North Road Street. While the applicant was previously proposing a new southbound bike lane that is shared with today's conditions, as the only improvement, they have now revised their layout on the street to propose enhanced bike lanes in both directions of road streets. So in the northbound direction, we will have a buffer bike lane, and in the southbound direction, it will be protected. The width for these enhancements came through the removal of two on-street parking spaces on the east side of Road Street. Um, lastly, the applicant is also coordinating with county staff on the CIP project at Wilson Boulevard and North Road Street. Building upon the improvements, street and sidewalks surrounding the site, the applicant is proposing better access management through the removal of three driveways of, of, of the five existing driveways surrounding the site. The site will continue to use two driveways that exist today that serve the alley connecting Wilson Boulevard and Clarence. The private alley will continue to support garage access for the site's residential and retail uses. And a new addition to the site is a proposal of two loading pits. The project is proposing a 0.53 parking ratio for residential use and one space per 664 square feet of GFA for retail use. 108 spaces are located in the existing below grade garage, and 10 spaces will be located off site in the adjacent building's garage. In addition, the site is providing the minimum park bike parking. And then over back to Courtney. Um, so talking about community benefits, the in 2005, there was a site plan project that was approved for the site that included a rezoning and a change in the general land use plan designation. And as part of that change in the club, um, the applicant is required to provide a contribution that we often refer to as an up club contribution. Um, and since the 2005 project was not built, that's going to be project um, and it'll be fulfilled through on-site committed affordable housing units. We're also looking at site plan community benefits, um, participation in the building incentive program as part of that, as well as uh, we're exploring additional affordable housing contributions. And then looking at potential ways to uh, use a monetary contribution towards off-site transportation improvements or public space um, the applicant's going to go in further depth on this, so I just wanted to highlight that they are um, participating in the Green Building Incentive Program at the 0.35 FAR level. So this includes elite gold certification, energy optimization, um, energy star score of AED, um, and then they're meeting the baseline prerequisites, which include energy star appliances, water sense features, um, EV charging, 4%. EV chargers and then 15% um, EV ready infrastructure and then uh, using bird friendly facade materials. Uh, so with that, we're going to wrap up our staff presentation and turn it over to the applicant, but just want to highlight where we were with the timeline of this project. We're at the second SPRC meeting. We're looking our next step would be Transportation Commission, Housing Commission and Planning Commission. And the earliest we do that would be June. So we're looking at a tentative June time frame for that and then going to the county board as well. Um, with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I will say I, I just wanted to flag that we also were very interested to in this PRC's conversation tonight and also to get feedback on the stoop, uh, things that we've worked out that Sergio presented. With that, I'll stop sharing. Hi. Uh, I have geared uh, mid presentation by staff, but I exist. Hello, sorry. Uh, the transition of 21 month old to babysitter <laughs> is never as easy as you think it is going to be. Um, so, uh, apologies for being late. Um, I understand the applicant still has a presentation to go, but just to orient us a little bit for the evening, um, the agenda is SPRC welcome and introduction. Did we already do that? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. So we're moving right along. Staff presentation. I know we did that because I caught half of it. 
Uh, next will be applicant presentation, and then the items for discussion tonight will be project updates, which I know we just were hearing through some of those, transportation, construction, community benefits. I know we've got a preview of that. Um, I heard some things I'm very excited about. And other, oh, I love a good other. Uh, and then public comment. Um, so that will be the agenda for this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you. Um, and while um, Alicia is bringing up the, the slideshow, uh, my name is Andrew Painter with Walsh Colucci, representative of Fortis, um, and want to express our appreciation for the last SPRC meeting, uh, the feedback that we received. Um, we spent the last, you know, six weeks or so uh, evaluating a couple of things. And I'm just going to give a quick preview of this real fast, but, um, you know, evaluating the clear sidewalk width, especially along Clarendon Boulevard. Uh, we had a lot of good feedback last time. My hat's off really to um, our architects and to our civil engineer for trying to find a way to sort of come up with a compromise approach. And, um, and I appreciate staff, uh, staff work on that as well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we've also looked for ways to incorporate anything additional into the treatment of the building. And I, I, I think there was a, a general consensus that the nod that we were doing with the curvature of the building kind of emulated roadside growth. But we have just a little, a little additional thing that we'd like to, to throw in front of you and see what you think. Um, we have confirmed issues related to outdoor noise. We have noted where outdoor retail seating uh, and restaurant seating can be located. Uh, we have confirmed our environmental approach, which we'll walk through, uh, and then we have honed in on our transportation issues as well. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia um, to walk through some of the project updates. She's going to hand it off to Jeff, who is our landscape uh, and civil uh, engineer with uh, BICO. We'll then turn it off to Mike uh, Workowski with Wells and Associates to walk through the transportation issues. And then Hannah with Sustainable Building Partners is going to talk about the building sustainability elements. And then I'll wrap up uh, with whatever time we have left with community benefits and construction. But we're going to try to keep this to 10 minutes. So, Alicia. 30 seconds or less, I'll go through all the project updates. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one of which you got a little bit of a sneak preview um, from Sergio's presentation earlier, but we are excited to say that through working with the county, we have been able to achieve the desired eight foot clear. We made two moves to accomplish that. Number one, we skinnied up the stooped walls on the north side. And then, like Sergio mentioned, we also revised the footprint of the tree wells to the south. So we're holding the same soil volume, just in a narrower and longer shape. The second update we wanted to give very quickly is with regard to the comments about our architectural nods um, that are honoring the existing roadside grill building. So in some of the previous discussions, there was some discussion around the glass block that's on the existing building and if there is a way to incorporate some of that into the facades. So you can see here we've done a series of design studies, but we we've landed on one that we think we really like with the glass block introduced here at the piers to either side of this corner retail with the curve. And this adds a nice little jewel. It'll have some reflectivity. We think this will be a, a nice feature for that corner. All right, short and sweet. I'll hand it off to Jeff. That was short and sweet. I will do my best to uh, keep pace. Um, good evening, I'm Jeff Krebs with VICA, uh, Director of Landscape Architecture there. And I'm just gonna briefly walk you through the landscape elements most of which you have heard before. Uh, starting broadly, the open space consists of the streetscape. Uh, as Sergio mentioned, 16 feet eight, clear around the entirety of the, of the property, which is great. Um, we've got two elevated patios or courtyards at the second level. And then at the seventh level, there's a small amenity terrace you can see on the bottom of the screen uh, that fronts toward Clarendon with good exposure to the south. Um, from a landscape perspective, really what we're doing is we're addressing the ground plane with you know native street trees and a native ground cover and shrub palette which will be provide that sort of physical and visual buffer between the pedestrians on the sidewalk and the folks on the road uh, and then of course that's just sort of repeated and echoed reinforced above uh, in the courtyards as well with another uh, native plant palette and a smaller scale design up there um, Typical amenities in the courtyard. Again, this is pr designed primarily for passive use. So seating areas, places to read, dine, uh, perhaps grill, but a very, very passive. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we're addressing the county's commitment to biophilia through the introduction as we can of na natural elements at the ground plane so that the pedestrians are uh, 
put into close proximity with things other than concrete uh, and glass, right? So we're trying to, again, we're trying to introduce this nice thickly planted street edge. Uh, we're working with the architect. Uh, we're in uh, preliminary conversations with a, a vendor about the green walls along Clarendon. Again, we have nice exposure down there. So we think we can introduce that second green edge vertically there. And also to introduce uh, natural elements in the pavement right outside of the clear sidewalk but complementary to that and of course that's ADA compliant paving but it might be a different material it could be stone could be something else uh, not to not decided yet but that's the intent is to again bring that sort of sense of uh, nature closer to uh, the pedestrians um, then I think lastly I'll just talk quickly about metrics we are exceeding our tree canopy goals on site. We are exceeding our tree replacement requirements on site. And as Alicia mentioned, we will be, of course, in compliance with all the soil volume requirements for, uh, for the street trees as well. So I think a fairly good story and I'll be happy to talk about it later. And with that, I think I'm gonna pass the baton to Mr. Rakowski. Mike, are you there? No, that he was having difficulty. There we go. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mike Borkowski. I'm with Wells and Associates here to talk about the transportation elements. Um, won't belabor some of the points that you heard earlier from Sergio. This is the um, existing conditions plan. Shows the uh, the two way driveway uh, alleyway on the west side. Uh, that serves the underground parking garage, uh, two access points from one on Wilson and one on Clarendon that serves the surface parking lot, and then the loading dock access that's also on Clarendon Boulevard. Here are the next. So this is the proposed conditions. Um, talked about some of these elements also. So we have the two-way private driveway. It does get widened to 20 feet on the southern end. Uh, there is a pedestrian pass through that will be shielded behind the columns that you see there. Um, all the frontages along the site frontage will have the clear widths that are necessary for pedestrian movements. Both uh, curb cuts the on Wilson and Clarendon Boulevard to the uh, surface parking lot go away and the loading dock uh, driveway gets relocated to the private driveway. Um, the underground parking garage access uh, continues to remain uh, where it is. Next slide, please. As was mentioned, this is the um, the Arlington County safety project that's planned at the uh, Wilson Boulevard and Road Street intersection. You can see there is a floating bus stop plan in the northwest quadrant of the intersection, along with some improvements to the um, curb returns, uh, new traffic signal equipment and um, tightening up of the intersection to um, enhance pedestrian movements. And you can also see that through the coordination that the uh, our proposed curb lines generally match those curb lines that are proposed with this project. Next slide, please. There we go. So the next one is this is uh, the Clarendon Boulevard cross section on the top uh side of the sheet uh it's 43 feet curb to curb um that shows the kind of the current condition with various lane widths and the bike lane adjacent to the parking uh whereas on the bottom part of the uh the sheet uh still maintains the same 43 foot width but it shifts the bike lane against the curb uh to buffer the bike lane there next please Next slide is the uh, North Road Street um, intersection. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see what the current proposal shows, um, the addition of a separated bike lane in the southbound direction. The northbound one exists today. On the right-hand side is an option for that, uh, for the this piece of Road Street that removes the parking on the east side of the road or the northbound side, puts the bike lane against the curb, maintains the same number of travel lanes, then adds parking, and then puts the southbound bike lane uh, against the curb on the western side. So main, maintains essentially the same uh, curb to curb length. It's just use of that area differently and also uh, removal of 
the three parking spaces on the east side. And uh, with that, I will um, pass it to the sustainability and be uh, available for questions. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. This is Hannah Spates with Cooper Carey. I'm the sustainability lead on the project. So I just wanted to bring up a few sustainability attributes that were taken into account at this stage, among all the other Arlington County requirements and some of the um, what we're looking to exceed as well. So I have the general overview up at the top, rating system, uh, lead V4, MFMR gold, and um, energy star during post-occupancy. Um, and then also wanted to quickly call out our understanding of the additional percentage reductions that's required um, as of the June 2023 revisions to the to the green building policy. Uh, so we're looking at that 24% reduction from ASHRAE 90.1 2010. Um, we also wanted to call out a few other important attributes on the project here. We're looking at full uh, electrification of ventilation systems up at the top right there, uh, exploring heat pump DOAS um, as opposed to the gas option. Um, we're also looking at renewable energy, our two approaches to it. We're currently exploring co-location. So looking at that partial vegetation roof with the on-site solo over top and meeting those thresholds that we have there. Um, depending on space, if we can't accommodate that, then we would be uh, we'll be exploring new offsite solar for tier two procurement, and that would um, equal 10% of the total annual energy usage. So that's kind of overview of energy right now. Um, we also wanted to call out a few other things here down at the bottom. Um, we're aware and designing to the bird friendly material requirements, um, looking at that maximum threat factor for the required threshold of eight feet between 36 feet. So um, we have that called out here. Um, and then the final thing that we really wanted to touch on today was EV chargers and infrastructure. So um, this is the baseline requirement for the green building policy. Um, we have the threshold percentage requirements to meet for the general charging stations and the infrastructure based off of our 118 total parking spaces. Um, right now, we're actually looking to exceed that and um, provide additional chargers as well as additional infrastructure, but we're just trying to understand um, transformer capacity uh, and, and how that um, is all measuring out with the heat pump DOAS as well as um, some other renewable energy. So uh, we're just trying to balance that at this time, but we're looking to exceed those numbers. And that's all I have. So um, just in terms of the last two slides, uh, in terms of construction timeline, um, if there is an approval of this application in the middle of this year, we would be looking to start construction in late 2025. There's still about a year's worth of civil engineering plan, site plan type things that have to occur before we can pull a permit to do anything. Uh, and then you can sort of track about 18 months from that point in time. So hopefully the building would deliver by the middle of 2027. Um, there are a series of things that are required under the standard site plan conditions um, that, you know, have to be approved by the county. Uh, and this is really to ensure, uh, you know, minimalization of uh, construction activity on the surrounding neighborhood. So there's a traffic plan. There's a hauling route plan. Uh, we have to provide off street parking uh, and or transportation subsidies for our construction workers. Uh, there's temporary construction measures, lighting measures, et cetera. Uh, there are also construction hour limitations set forth in the uh, standard site plan conditions as well. Uh, and then Fortis would also have a series of meetings with the community, probably commencing as soon as the application is done, uh, to whom concerns could be raised um, and, and, and to address any issues. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and then, as Ms. Badger mentioned, in terms of community benefits, um, there are a series of things that we're working on right now. This is just sort of a list of them, the streetscape upgrades around the site, uh, architecture design and massing goals, uh, utility fund contribution, uh, transportation demand management to reduce the amount of single occupancy vehicles emanating from the site during peak hours. Uh, there's a commuter services contribution, public art contribution, uh, and there's affordable housing. And there's really three levels of affordable housing that occur on the site. The first is the baseline uh, affordable, base density affordable contribution, and that's set forth in the zoning ordinance. Okay, so like you have the option of providing on site units near offsite units or a contribution uh, that is spelled out to the Arlington uh, Housing Investment Fund or the Affordable Housing Investment Fund. Uh, so that's sort of the first tier. The second tier, uh, as was mentioned, was the uh, there's a formula for whenever there is a GLUP amendment or an up GLUP. 
there is a percentage of the increase in density that you're supposed to provide as on-site affordable. And it's a gross number. And it's about 30, 3,200 square feet or so uh, that has to be provided in the form of affordable housing. Um, and then third, the third tier is the on-site affordable units in exchange for, for um, bonus density. So we are requesting bonus density here. Um, and so that, that discussion about how much the types of units, the square footages, that sort of thing, we're just getting into that conversation with staff right now, um, but all of that has to be done in exchange for um, uh, affordable, uh, excuse me, exchange for bonus density. Uh, and then there's also a commuter service contribution. I think it's a repeat of the, the, the last one there. Uh, our apologies for that. But we've also talked and, you know, coming out of discussions from last time, talked about a contribution towards um, uh, yeah, parks and recreation. Uh, we do have roadside green uh, park across uh, Catacorn with this, as well as offsite transportation. So all of those will be worked on between now and the time that this gets to the, um, the county board. Um, so that is a summary of where we've been uh, and kind of where we're headed. And so hopefully it tees up the discussion for this evening. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, we're gonna open with clarifying questions and then we'll get into the rest of the agenda. I have a question. Yep. Um, I'm new to this type of thing. So tell me if it's clarifying all that. Sure. But, um, when the audience talks about sorry, can I one other thing? Since I was late here and I missed the introduction part, can you all say your name before you give a comment? I appreciate that. Sure. And association. Sure. Um, Ann Wong, um, uh, Promptons HOA. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when the group talks about um, the applicant and the, the county have come to an agreement on, say, the the sidewalk clearance and all that, what does that really mean? Does it mean that we can't change it, or it was just the current agreement is thus. So in, I wouldn't even say it's an agreement. Yeah, the case of the sidewalk thing, we had discussions and we've gone back and forth about different options and exploring it. So we, I would say we've come to an agreement. I think it's still ongoing discussion and would love to hear your guys' opinion and thoughts and how you feel like it impacts you. So no agreement has been made on that side. Okay, then I have one follow on about the sidewalk. Last meeting we talked about with stoops, um, folks might put, they put potted plants and they explain the, the reach of their stoop. And there was a suggestion to have guidelines provided to the, the, um, the, the residents who live there to say, you can't put stuff randomly out on the sidewalk. Is that, has that been accepted? What is the state status of that? I mean, I think we would probably have for you, right? But I think we'd probably provide that information as a part of the opening package, the welcome package, uh, along with all their rights and responsibilities. But the areas that's outside of the stoop are going to be under a public access easement as well. So they should not be putting anything in, in areas that, again, are supposed to be in a clear sidewalk width area. But I don't, did I get that? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we'd be happy to put those guidelines in place. I mean, you know, these are rental apartments, so uh, we certainly could have guidelines in place on the use of the stoops. I, mean, I don't have any concerns with that. Uh, so, clarifying question. Okay, yeah. Mr. Peterson. Um, so, I have a question about the tree pits. Tenley Peterson. Oh, sorry, Tenley Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. No, I, that's why I was able to forget you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the tree pits, and you mentioned they're not ideal for trees. What does that mean? That they're more likely to tip over because the roots can't spread out north south the same way that they can east west, or that they won't grow as quickly, or they won't grow as strongly, or Certain types of trees can be in there, not others, or you know, what is that? Take that one. Uh, it really depends on like the root growth, and four feet has been considered it's like bare minimum. Five feet is ideal. So that's that's a, that's where we're trying to you know give the most room. For this growth. Um, you know, there are lengths as well, so it's like five by. I think we're getting 16 now, but it was by 12. Yeah, we're into that. So that so the overall area has grown. Um, it's just that we have gone there where past what was five feet. Could do a follow up on Commissioner Peterson's question. Do we have Are other areas in the county where person. we can have four foot wide tree pits that we can point to that they either work or they don't work? Yeah, do we? Yes, I believe we do. Yeah. Do I have that knowledge right off the top of my head? No, probably but not. Me, but we've we'll had experience with time. it. And what has that experience been? Good, bad, or good? Um, 
understand that this is our second SPRC. There will not be a third SPRC. Um, that's information that we would expect to have provided, you know, before the PC meeting. And I think if you can email that to the membership of this group, that would be good yes, as well. Absolutely. Commissioner Starley, that was my question. Well, that was my question. Um, okay. So I'll make a quick comment that the drawings are confusing because every drawing has a slightly different drawing of what the tree pit looks like. So you can just coordinate across from them. One shows them continuously tree pit, one shows like the shape, and then one, you know, the technical one is actually 16 by 16 by four instead of 12 by five. Okay. Um, so that would be helpful to get that those drawings sort of consistent by the time for their presentation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Kirk Pulpitz, Kona Village, too. Oh. Alicia, I'll follow up on the Sun study. You mentioned that you had, uh, we had initial concerns about the lack of the sun in some parts of Kona Village. So they had kind of, re I think, a revised study. Right. Yes. Is, is now an okay time for me to share that with the group? We've got a, a diagram showing the yeah. impact of shadow on Colonial Villages. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so, um, yes, we did look pretty closely at what the shade impact will be, the shadow impact on colonial villages. So I'll start here with sort of a high level overview of what the shadows will be like throughout the year. Um, when we looked at this initially, we found that in the summer, which you can see is the column on the right, and then in the spring and the fall, which is the column in the middle, the, our shadow from our building really doesn't hit the colonial villages structures across the street. The only time that there's really any concern would be in the winter between sunrise and 3 p.m. So we, we've got this red box around these, this time period here. This is the area that we wanted to zoom in a little closer and do some more detailed study. Look the next page. Now, this page shows a series of different potential shadows. So I'll talk through kind of what the different colors are. I know it's a lot of information, but we wanted to be sure we understood what the impact is going to be. So the first color that you'll see is going to be the gray shadow. The gray shadows are out there today. That's that's the current shadow condition from the existing buildings on site. So um, moving from that 9 a.m. period, we broke down to a one hour increment. So you see 10 a.m., then 11 a.m., noon, and then the three by 3 p.m., all the shadows are clear. So across those four one hour increments, you can see the dark gray is the existing shadows. The darkest color of blue is the existing buildings on our site. So it's the NSTA, the roadside, and the Ilverdikio. Il and then there's two other shades of blue. The medium blue that you can see here, and actually, let me zoom up. Medium shade of blue is the, um, the allowable 55 foot um, form that could potentially be occupying the site relative to the lightest shade in blue, which is our proposed structure. Um, with the mechanical penthouses. Um, so what we found is that relative to what's currently in shade on site today, to what we're proposing, there's a very limited impact to any given portion of the facades. And that's what's highlighted here in red. So anywhere you see the, the little red lines, that's an area that here at 9 a.m., for example, there's a handful of units that are currently in sun, but will be in shade for that 9 a.m. time period. In the winter. In, in the winter. Cool. Yep. Yeah, only in the winter. In the mornings, in the winter. So by the time we get to 10 a.m., though, you look at that same stretch of the facade that was in shade at 9 a.m. By 10 a.m., it's the shadow's gone and it's in sun. So long story short, what we found through all of this is that 
any given portion of the building, any given residence unit, they have about an hour longer shade in the morning, in the winter, but that's really the extent of the impact. So I'll just pan a little bit to the right. You can see here the 10 a.m., the small portions of the facade that are in shade a little bit longer. Here at 11, it's really these just these two little pieces facing to the south. And then by noon, again, there's just a small portion that, that holds that shadow just a little bit longer than it does currently. So we hope that's good news. <laughs> Better than we expected, honestly. Okay. We didn't know what to what to expect once we did a little bit of a deeper dive, but once you get into March or whatever, then it pretty much Yeah, by the by the spring, um the sun is higher in the sky, the shadows get shorter, and they're not gonna be touching the building through spring, summer, and into the fall. Yeah, that's helpful things. Yeah. Um that was very helpful. Thank you for doing the shadow study. Um, I'm going to go to Caroline Haynes, um, whose hand is raised. Caroline? Great, thank you. Yeah, I just had a couple follow-on questions about the trees. Question, and I have a little issue on the, some of the drawings as well. Did we lose trees in, uh, is the number the same from the initial proposal? This is my first question. The number yes. is? The, the number is the same. We did not lose okay. any trees. Okay, and then my second question is, is there a plan to use structural cells? Because that would certainly improve with those narrow um, tree pits. You are going to be using structural cells? We would have to, even if they were five feet, we would have to use structural cells just to get the volume correct. Yes. Okay, good. And then on one of the drawings, I saw a liriope in there. Are we still planting a liriope in the county? There's so many it's great sedges. It may be on a... Yeah, it may be on a plant list, but we don't root, we don't plant liriope anymore. So it's that's one of the things that's been... Uh, sort of stricken. <laughs> okay, available. and it may have been the staff presentation, but I was just really surprised to see that. Um, yeah. No. And then my last question is, and I, we may have discussed this at the at the first meeting. Um, are we? Uh, are there? Are you all planning on allowing dogs? Because that obviously impacts those plants right around as well as the park. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. And are there any special provisions for dogs? Are there going to be? There's no area for dog runs, presumably. There will be no areas for dog runs. There is a limit, a weight limit of, I think, approximately 50 pounds. Yeah, it's it's actually a breed, you know, it would be the standard breed restrictions that you'd see of any, you know, property management, national property management company. So, yeah, call it around 50 pounds, but it's really a, a breed restriction. Then I guess I would just put kind of a placeholder for the discussion about community benefits and contributions to parks, because there's going to be a lot of pressure on that park and, um, you know, will be important to really take care of that. So anyway, just as a a future talking point. Thank you. So I'm going to call on myself. Um, I know we had um, briefly talked about where the puppies would go poo poo last time. So I don't know if we had any kind of resolution to that for an update. I was sort of curious. Yeah, go ahead. Caroline brought us to the doggy portion. Yeah, as as a dog lover, <laughs> I'm sure many of others on the team have pets as well. Um, we we did look very very closely and tried to find a space within the square footage of of mm -hmm. the building within the within the property to allow that amenity, but there's really no place um, without a significant impact to to the program that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so unfortunately, we're not able to provide either a run or a relief area within the the building proper. So I, I think that does go to what. Uh, Caroline Haynes was, was addressing that that is something to talk about in terms of contribution to a park, because I, I do think that that is a, a real impact that we're going to be seeing. Um, so I actually saw Nia and then Gary. So should I assume? Um, sorry, Nia Begley, planning okay. commission. Um, so should I assume that, and thank you for the shadow studies, that when you select the plantings for the various sizes of buildings, which will be shade or light dependent, um, and on the biophilia, which we all want to see as much of as possible, that those will be coordinated based on what is best for the shaded versus sunny spots, giving them the opportunity, best opportunity to survive. Should I assume that's correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Right plant, right place, as they say. Yes. Terry Pearl, North Rosalind Civic Association. I have been asking the county for almost 20 years to make sure that no large building has, does not have, and it allows pets, does not have a place for pet pooping. 
Um, I think you have two seventh floor, you have a seventh floor terrace and you have another terrace. I would like to see perhaps that you would investigate whether part of that could be for pets because that park cannot survive that many dogs. Oh. Um, I'm going to call it. We've moved outside of the clarifying question portion. Mm -hmm. We're just into the agenda now. So <laughs> <laughs> clarifying questions that we no longer get your own special time to do so. Um, that said, uh, we've been discussing project updates, so I think we're firmly in that, um, perhaps segueing into transportation. That's where I would like to get us pretty quickly. Um, Mr. Peterson. Well, I had clarifying questions about sure. OK, um, so for the bike parking, is there space for e-bikes and cargo bikes and like charging options? For e -bikes? Yeah, actually, you know, we have not discussed um, e-bike charging, but that is something that we should mm -hmm. look into. Yeah. yeah. We just haven't discussed it yet. Good question. In cargo bike parking, so, because there's a new one in the Silver Diner parking lot with the Target, and I saw someone post an ice photo of it the other day, and I was like, oh yeah, awesome. What is a cargo one? bike? Like the giant bikes with like the big buckets. You put all your kids for groceries. You ride around town. Like, you can actually you know, park like groceries there. Yeah. I can give you a ride in mine after the pickup. <laughs> we're happy to take it. we're happy to look at that and find the space in the garage for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a bicycle SUV. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gas guzzling. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Sarley, and then Ms. Wong. I had a slightly clarifying question mm -hmm. about the glass block. I think um, I think that's good or bad. Uh, I'm honestly not sort of against it in any way. Um, you know, I think it's great if there's some sort of buyback. I don't know exactly the detail where it comes from, but um, my question for me is a maintenance and a backlit idea. I mean, glass block, you know, usually refers to light, you know, glass in general, see through and all that stuff. So if it's just on the masonry and like nothing behind it, I guess I'd be a little bit nervous about it um, because then it becomes a little gratuitous. Um, if it's backlit or there's a little bit of a feature associated with it, and the follow-up question would be maintenance and access and blah, blah, blah. But I think, you know, um, that was just a little comment slash question. Yeah, and I think, um, so the two particular piers where we're proposing it, there's actually a column behind. So we did discuss, you know, would it be able to have light coming in from either side or the other? In this case, it will be blanked off in the back. So if we do want illuminated, it would have to be an artificial light behind. Can I add the glass block? It was a, it came from an idea of our historic preservation staff because the glass block at the original building, I forget what it was before the inside grill, but they used glass block in the facade of our architecture. Um, so there is like some historic buyback. By the door off the it's on the parking parking lot side. Yeah, I think I've got a photo of it. Yes. I can search through my Uh, and just while we're paused here, uh, I did just post the shadow study that they presented on the website, so um, it, it should pull it up right now. You should be able to see. Um, I believe I said Ms. Wong. Is that? Um, yes, yes. Thank you so much. So going back to the sidewalk, um, I have a photo of the block before. So looking southbound, right? This is the the newer facility, and then there's the NST. Down right there. And what we were talking about last time in uh, in concert with the wideness of the sidewalk is the choke point that occurs because the sidewalk of the structure a little further north has a sidewalk that's, I think Peterson was 20 some odd feet, and it's going to narrow down to an eight foot uh, clearance. And so there's a choke point that's going to be created because of that. And so I just really wanted to say for the record that that's still a concern for some of us who are using that block very actively to go from 10 plus, 15 plus feet down to eight feet as we cross the threshold onto the NST property. So we actually, I, I hear what you're saying and it does taper as it comes down the block, but the piece that's adjacent to where, where our alley will go across and then our sidewalk will pick up is gonna be consistent. So the the clear walking width, there's a tree well on the one side and then sort of the, the unit entries and the, the landscaping on the other, but that clear walk dimension is going to be consistent from when you hop from one side of the alley to the other. 
and then it gets down to eight feet. No, it's actually so we. It's the the concrete itself is going to stay consistent if that those two lines pick up. Okay, yeah, because the, the red brick that you see on the right hand side here in your picture, that's actually the tree well zone. So there's a tree well kind of off frame, I'm assuming just right right behind the um, the image here. And, and we'll have a similar pace where you have a tree well and then hardscaping and then a tree well and then hardscaping. But it'll be the, the dimensions overall will be consistent, we'll pick up. Across from one side of the alley to the other. Minus the stoops that'll be sticking out the other way. For the for that one for that one section, yes. Except except what we are proposing is it will be a consistent eight foot section because we're narrowing down the tree. We're proposing to narrow down the tree well to four feet instead of five feet. Um, I also say too when we were looking at the um, the existing NSTA approval, what's approved on the site today, they were required to have sixteen foot setbacks from the back of curb to the face of the building. So I think we're doing 16 foot, eight feet um, for that. Uh, is what we're proposing there. Great. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just want to remind folks we are in the transportation section. So we'll try to have our comment focus on transportation for the moment. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm 99% sure that Mr. Uh, Commissioner Slats is going to be transportation. So we're going to go ahead and make my words and then ask it anyway. We'll have the conversation. Commissioner Slats. Awesome. Yeah. And we're transportation. And it doesn't have to be clarifying anything, right? We can nope. It's not clarifying. <laughs> Still ask them, but the special time for clarifying questions is done. Great. Then I just have comments. Um, uh, thank you. I think the updates and the transportation stuff generally are fantastic. Um, big fan of achieving the protective bikeway. Bike lane on roads, uh, on roads. Uh, big fan of achieving the protected bike lane on Clarendon Boulevard. Uh, though it doesn't seem like you had to do much, it was mostly just restriping the existing space. Um, but that's fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, I will say um, the knocking down the tree pits by a foot to get the eight foot clear sidewalk feels like the easy way out, not the, um, you know, well, something that requires trying very hard um, and requires you know, minimal changes to the building. Um, I think it is workable if that's what we need to do, but it just seems like there ought to be a way to shrink the stoops or bump something back a little bit because uh, it's such a small amount of distance that needs to get fixed there. Um, and uh, uh, I hope staff and the applicant continue to look a little bit at the design um, of the road street protected bike lane. Um, it's not really quite how I was expecting, especially the north side of Road. Uh, sorry, is that yes? The north side of Road Street. Um, so expecting more of a, like a protected intersection feel there at the entrance um, of the, the bikes. Right now, it's actually sort of unprotected, very briefly in the crosswalk area, rather than a lot of what we're seeing, like in Crystal City, um, where you know, as a pedestrian, you're coming off the sidewalk, you cross the bike lane, and then you have a brief additional amount of concrete um, that is protecting the bike lane. Um, that's kind of part of the crosswalk and that you continue across the the, the road to the car. Direction. Um, so I hope we can continue to look at that, um, but we're heading beautifully in the right direction. So bravo to everyone. Um, I will go to you in a second, but I'm going to take chair's privilege to say I would like to align myself with um, the first part of Commissioner Slot's statement. It does seem like narrowing the tree pit, taking all of the additional space to side up from the tree pits seems a little mean to the trees and I would like to think the scenario in which we are looking at sort of splitting the difference potentially even because I would imagine that if four feet is the minimum for a tree pit four and a half feet would make for somewhat happier healthier trees that so we can kind of maybe play around with where some of that width is coming back from I think that would be well received I think we I mean we we did look at it, it has not been easy an easy discussion as uh, Ms. Badger knows uh, and Sir Janice as well I mean um we, we did skinny up the stoops. One of the issues that we are running into is the width of the um, residential street. You know, we wanted to have streetscape activation along Clarendon, um, and we are running into a depth issue with these individual residential units because of the ramp for the existing garage, which we can't we can't mess with. Um, um, so I don't know, Alicia, you want to highlight it? Yeah, so the, the existing below grade garage and its ramp 
come up to grade and we're trying to hold all of that construction without demolition, right? So the, the biggest constraining factor is this cast in place retaining wall that exists today that runs east-west. And that that's forming the back wall of whatever this programmed interior space is gonna be. And that's an extremely tight, it's 18 feet. So to fit um, the residential use along that edge between, you know, the, the constraints pushing from the opposite direction, trying to get, get this clear sidewalk on the south and the position of that wall to the north were just very, 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 very tight. And so we did, we looked at skinning up the, the inside of the units. It's really not feasible to, to have residential use here in this position on the site in any smaller dimension. Steve Smith with Cooper Carey, that that would be, you would like to be in excess of 20 feet. We're down at 18 for that dimension. So we can't push north at all because of that wall. And that volume is up higher uh, as it exists today relative to the sidewalk. It's not everything, it's not something that's down below grade. Get through. And Steve, I think you all looked also at like insetting it too, right, Alicia? Like, yeah, can we just we push a little bit under? Right. We're already we did, and damaged, again, if you will, on the units. Yeah, it just it just takes more out of that that dimension for the interior space. So the stoops really need to be outside, and um, you know, we've tried. It's just really really tight the interior program. I wanted to add on that, uh, Serge Berkche. The minimum tree pit size in our landscape standards is like 60 square feet. Typical tree pit you see is 5 by 12. Um, those have been shrunk into 4 by 16. So we're exceeding that square footage in our standards. Though we you know, still want to see if there's some optimal design for both the trees and the sidewalk in this area. I just wanted to bring that up. I think it will be helpful when you're able to do the research and tell us where it's been successful or not. Because I think that. I think we appreciate that there are certain, and we covered this with the first SPRC. We are very excited that you're retaining the garage as is, and that's a huge energy savings. And no one, you know, we understand there may be some accommodations that need to be made as a result of that. If this is one of them, okay, I think we need to, we would have a higher level of comfort if we can see other examples within the county. I don't allow you to include Alexandria for um, where tree pits of this, you know, description that this type have been successful so that we're not just going to be sort of living with, you know, for ad infinitum trees that just can never grow are not successful and just sort of are sad. Look, it, it's not going to be to benefit the neighborhood, the environment or the new building to have trees that are just sad and sickly and can't actually grow. So I don't think that's in anyone's best interest. Um, I saw Commissioner Tenley's hand, then Ms. Prell. And I think Mr. Starley, you would hand as well. So one, two, three. Could you pull up the slide that showed the street widths? Like how wide are the lanes? And if, would there be an opportunity to narrow the lanes a little bit to make more space for them now? Four, <laughs> 43. Yeah, it, all, it all doesn't quite meet our ideal standard for a protected bike lane. Well, not giving up this like protected a, bike lane, but like if we made the car yeah, lane. They've shrunk every lane. Oh, and it's narrow. You can get it. <laughs> It's not Harry Potter. You don't have the bus. <laughs> uh, Ms. Crawford. This is, I grew up because I'm very old. With sidewalks, you can barely get a bicycle down. What happens if the sidewalk is seven foot six or seven foot eight instead of eight foot? Yeah. It would be smaller than our policy guidance. That's guidance. I mean, if we were to get four inches different, you, it might make a difference to keeping the trees alive. And it seems to me that the average person, especially since there's going to be treatments, would not notice the shrinking of four inches or so. I appreciate the feedback. I do not think Ms. Wong next to you, and this is not going the direction that Ms. Wong. You no, know, because she wants she wants that 25 foot cut. I'm, I'm, we're not going to get that. But I'm just letting you know that your your neighbor is going apoplectic. Um, I understand. I think the, the goal is to find a balance between. I mean, this is the the art of architecture, sure. right? What we try to do in our in our everyday lives. So finding that happy balance where the trees are going to live, and people can still push strollers and there are little the right spaces in, run the inside space. the unit. Yeah, so it's a little, it's, you know, it's down to the inch in this case, but we're, we're trying to find a happy medium. 
um, Commissioner Sarley. On the inch sort of um, category, I did notice <laughs> that the, the stoop has a very wide um, wall next to it. Can we make that a little bit lighter and a little bit thinner? And that could potentially provide us like nine inches to the tree pit and still keep the eight foot sidewalk. That is one of the moves that we've made. So we've actually already cut. We've checked with our structural engineer in order to to keep the wall standing. We've got it down to a bare minimum of a, of a six inch structure at the interior. So that that wall is is one of the things that we've already. So cut. six inches and then brick facade veneer. Yeah, let me. So I, I saw in the detail and I appreciate it, but I think like you know perhaps this is where we go to a clear, um, great handrail or something that is um, even thinner. And it doesn't have to, you know, have such a, a hefty structure. And I understand that the design concept of the building calls for these sort of um, substantive planters and um, stoops. But you know, maybe there's a, a way to achieve that and still create sort of a more, perhaps porous, even um, thin metal, you know, railing that would allow you to take back, you know, what is almost. Well, it is 12, well, no, nine, I'm seeing nine, nine and five eighths to be a little specific, um, you know, and that could be helpful to the tree pit, you know. Um, so I appreciate you having thought about it. Maybe we go a little step further. Um, and then since I have the microphone, if I can pivot back to transportation. <laughs> <laughs> You're still in transportation. Right, right. That, or walking is transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That'll be an argument um, that trees are transportation. Right. <laughs> Presentation slide seven and then slide nine. And I'm trying to understand, and maybe uh, Commissioner Slap can comment here. The intersection, what's happening with that intersection, particularly on the so this is the northeast intersection, but I want the southwest corner where um, on slide seven it shows in red a really rounded curb, which I don't see the need for. Maybe I'm misreading this, Commissioner Slap, so please correct me. And then on slide nine, um, there's a more, I think, um, ideal squared out. You know, there's no need to um, interfere with sight lines or curve, um, make that a curved because there's no cars turning on that particular corner. Oh, yes, they are. Since it's a one way. So if you scroll up to yeah. slide seven, and again, this is just a drawing conflict, and I'm just seeking clarity more than anything else. Yeah, we, we, um, this is Mike Workoski. We, did talk about that corner as we were coordinating with um, county staff. We were trying to make sure that really that the curb lines and such um, matched up because of you know where the where the building and the sidewalks and all the setbacks would be. But you're correct. That's one of the corners where you don't need a large curb return. It can be tighter there because you know you don't have right turns. It's it's one way westbound. Well, this commissioner votes is for the tighter curb corner. I concur with that. So, I'm sorry, we never made it back to you. Did you want to ask it? Um, yeah, quickly. So, yeah, I think one of, one of them was answered by the, the drawings. The units that the stoops, that's the only in, entry into the unit. No, no, that's right. Okay. Um, then I, I sort of wanted to piggyback. You also had to say, I, I agree. It's, it feels kind of what well, now you have the pedestrians fighting against the folks. You maybe two of those lofts become maybe three of the lofts become two. Just there. You know, for four inches, I'd rather have an extra unit. We need units. So I wouldn't want to cut a unit in order to give a little bit more space for the tree. Again, it's balancing environmental. Well, then that's housing support, so I'd rather compete. Smaller. Already pretty small. Anything else in the transportation? Yeah. I just want to say uh, that curb, that corner is the one that I also have issues with uh, design wise. So just need, I think that needs another look to try and better protect the bike lane. And I think part of this is all just. I think it feels like these changes came along pretty recently, and some of these drawings are real new. So I think it's just a little inconsistent. But that's all I have. I was going to say I was happy to hear that you're trying to expand EV 
Six Nations. And I know in particular, Liverpool mentioned great interest in the infrastructure being there and it can be ready or just something that does not stand in the way of future more universal access. To it, I, I think if you're just starting to see what's going to be available, what your supply is going to be in there. That's that's correct. We've got some some baselines that we're working with, and in, in what the transformer can can handle. Um, so we've confirmed that we can absolutely hit the four percent of the baseline. We're we're hoping we can get more than that, but we're just not quite sure exactly how much yet. I think we agree with what, what is said by what is it? C the uh, committee that deals C two E two. I know that they would want to expand considerably more. Certainly support whatever you can do there. The other question I had is uh, with parking. Uh, you mentioned that you were losing a couple of curbside spaces, but that's actually on the east side of roads. I'm wondering what is the do you roughly know what the, the net, I know that you're creating some additional curbside spaces by cutting out some of the curb cuts and you were trying to maximize that. Uh, hopefully that's still the case because there's a lot of need for, for that in the community and also the idea of the vibrant center talking about their multimodal nature of it. So do you have an idea what maybe the net is on, on curb space? Uh, as a result of the project. Yeah, Mike, do you want to take that one? Um, I'm not sure what the exact net is. I think it's about a wash because you lose three on that east side. But That's since true. we closed the other curb cuts, you know, the one on Wilson and both on Clarendon, we probably pick up three or four spaces doing that. So it's probably very close, my guess. I just want to jump in. Uh, it's two metered spaces on the east side. Um, that, that's what I saw out in the field. Chris tried to tell me that there's only two single meters there. Not three. Yeah, I'll let you take that one. I want to pick up on Stuart. I live in a building which we found that our transformers are not strong enough to be able to put EV in other than one space. And I think if you're not looking farther into the future, looking at 15% just seems really low. I think that that's, you're not looking to keep this building going for, for many, many years. And you look like you're making a structure we hope will last for 25 or 30 years. And it's, it is a real problem in older buildings to be able to do that. That, I mean, that's, and Hannah, I don't know if, if you or Josh are available, maybe sustainable building partners can talk about it. It's, it's actually a universal issue. I think we're finding with all of the multifamily buildings is getting enough load capacity to be able to serve all of the electric utilities in the building, plus all of the electric vehicle charging and stuff like that. So we are trying to future proof it as much as we can, um, but there is a serious concern about Dominion's long-term ability to service these. But, and I don't know if you, you're available. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely jump in here. I'm just pretty much mirroring what you just said, where uh, across just the gambit, we're seeing issues with the push towards electrification, which is obviously critical, and then the additional infrastructure for EV, and then just actually having the EV chargers there themselves. So um, it, it, we're going to be working closely with Dominion to make sure that we can, you know, meet thresholds and push the push the boundaries here, especially as we push towards electrification, since we know that that is the that's what the industry is is pushing towards and what we need to be um looking towards now so um so yeah we're we're still in discovery with that about how we can push the boundaries in terms of numbers and um we were also exploring looking at the ev charging infrastructure extra as part of our far requirements um because we need to meet three of those extras um you know we're at this point we're still like i said exploring if we can even meet those because the additional threshold is rather high but i completely agree i mean there we're going to need to keep pushing for more infrastructure for more um for more ev chargers uh there's just a lot to balance right now as we see this incredible shift um from gas to to electric but laying down infrastructure even if it's not accessible at this point because it, it will save you a lot of money and stuff in the future because Mm -hmm. There are units where they can, they can keep putting put mooring online as the things change. If you don't have it down, it's awful. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen 
two additional comments, Commissioner Slat, the Commissioner Lantami, and then we're on to construction. Um, sorry, mine's a tiny topic shift, but still in transportation. Uh, the traffic signal at Rhodes and Wilson Boulevard um, is on site for this site um, and is kind of an older signal. Um, will you be replacing that as part of construction? Has that been discussed? Yeah, I believe that's part of the county's um, safety upgrade there. Is all, it also includes the signal equipment. Gotcha, but that's the county project, not. That's correct. Got opportunity to be better. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to follow up on, on uh, Ms. Bell's comments. I think she's absolutely right. Um, I, we've seen, I think, some buildings where they don't have the transformer capacity now, but they have preserved some space in the garage that could become transformer space by giving out the parking spot, for example, or one or two parking spots. And that even though they don't have the conduit, they don't have the wiring in, they have the ability to put conduits in, that the space is already there. That if you're, you don't have to drill through concrete, conduit space is already built in that the entire garage could be done, um, even though it isn't in fact wired. I don't think that is particularly, you know, it's a design issue going in. It shouldn't really add much, if anything, to cost, I would think. Um, so anyway, we've seen that in others, that that's the way they sort of future-proof their building, that even though they only had 10 or 15 spots, they had the ability to grow quite a lot because they were able to reserve this extra space. Or think it through that this space could be then be converted to the, what was needed for conduits and transform. Just throwing that out. Yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, that's great, great feedback. And I think, um, yeah, any innovative solutions that we can make to future proof ourselves will be absolutely explored here. Um, so yeah, if there's, if there's any other suggestions, but we will um, definitely be looking at that more. I think that's a great, that's a great example of maybe an option for us. Okay. Uh, I think that was a very productive conversation. Um, construction. Any discussion? Any questions? Yes, I have one. Um, this is a neighborhood that has a lot of people walking. How are you going to plan to keep bicycles moving and the bicycle lanes? Pedestrians able to walk along here during construction. What sort of provisions are going to need? Are these sidewalks going to have to be demolished on one part because the garage is going to extend under the existing sidewalks? Uh, I think preserving the existing garage is great. That's going to help with the sidewalks right there. But for the rest of the building, under um, under the roadside grill and Il, 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 Il Ridicchio, will that go out to the sidewalks? If the sidewalks have to just go away, and if so, how are we going to? People are going to have to do the, the puzzle work. They cross the street, then they have to cross back again. Uh, the bikes no longer have a protected lane. Um, how are we looking to do this? It, and and I think a lot of that would go, Mike Orkowski, to our maintenance of traffic um, plans that have to be approved by the county. We have to provide full pedestrian circulation around the site during periods of construction. We are allowed um, to intermittently close them for deliveries or for safety issues. Uh, or for the rebuilding of the actual sidewalk itself. Um, but Mike, do you want to speak to what that entails? Yeah, it, it's um whoever mentioned it's a it's a puzzle of things is is absolutely correct. Um, it's usually, you know, a combination of um, intermittent lanes that are shut down in certain periods so that access can be maintained during those times. And then there are certain times where, you know, when you actually have to build the sidewalk and you can't put pedestrians anywhere else, you may have to cross them somewhere else temporarily. I mean, there are a number of, you know, solutions that we'll have to come up with when we get to that point of, you know, maintenance of traffic plans. I mean, the concern is it's going to be shut down for, for two years. You know, that the entire time construction goes, that sidewalk access disappears, that bike lane disappears. That's, I think, what the big concern is. It isn't so much that intermittent intermittent closings or to replace the sidewalk, which everybody sees and understand. It's more the larger, okay, two years, it's gone. You know what, Terry Pearl, I live across from where the new key has been built that the, uh, in, uh, in Roslyn. I have had no access to my garage on days. I have had no sidewalks to walk on. My street has been closed down on a regular basis. And these are much more important streets 
And I don't know where you're going to put your construction vehicles. I mean, one of the reasons you can't get out of my garage is that there are construction vehicles and delivery vehicles filling both sides and the entire width of my street on a regular basis. And these people, I mean, Clarendon is and Wilson are the like the arteries that run Roslyn, run the whole county. I don't know where you're going to put all of these vehicles during construction. Rent the gas station across the street. We all walk that street, we all drive that street on a daily basis, and it can become impassable. I've seen it happen, and I'm really worried about these really important streets. And, and all of that is going to have to be flushed out, approved by the county um, prior to us. You could destroy that park and put your vehicles there and build a gorgeous one and replace it. That's an idea. With a dog. Is that the full response from the applicant for the moment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bagley, then Commissioner uh, Peterson. So, um, having lived through a lot of similar situations in Boston, where on the weekend I would get calls going, like close every sidewalk, you know. Communication, I cannot impress upon all of you the level of how important the communication, all the stakeholders, many of them are here. Um, it's not just good enough anymore to have a construction liaison, community liaison, because half of those people have never sat through any of these meetings. They don't know any of this stuff. They got a firm plan. They got to get the job done. That's it. So she's absolutely right. That's, you know, a major um, transportation, all kinds of transportation hub. It's really imperative that you spend a lot of time on the communication on this. And if the plans change after you communicate something, um, you need to go back and re-communicate it. I'd rather see you communicating to your public than under communicating so that you don't have issues where on the weekends there's just no place for a human to, to go. So thank you. Brian, did you want to say anything about this? No, I mean, we completely agree, and that's how we try and run them. We try and communicate with all the residents and, you know, and, and we'll have members of our team. And to so they understand, because the team on the ground has a deadline that they have to meet. They've not been in any of these meetings. They don't know, you know, this is just like, hey, I got to get it done, and these are my deadlines, my cost overrun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't see it like like we've talked about it here. So. Yeah, appreciate it. Commissioner Peterson. Uh, well, to Ms. Prowl's point, um, are you putting in any temporary crosswalks, maybe for the people that are just west of the site? Maybe they're just walking down to the corner and crossing. Now they'd have to walk up the street, up the hill to get across. Maybe there would be a temporary crosswalk to put in, um, like they did with the Wendy site on Clarendon. I think there's further up. Extra, extra, up right? Yeah, there were extra crosswalks that were right. put in just for the development. Uh, so we haven't like really discussed the MOT phasing of it. I think that's a great idea. Uh, one concern I have is like the downhill grade there. So putting in a, or introducing a crossing there, maybe the speeds that we see might not be ideal, but that's something that you know is typically done or perhaps uh, building some type of sidewalk passage on the roadway so that the user can get off the sidewalk area, get onto the roadway or some type of temporary curb ramp, and then you can bypass the construction area that way. You know, I, I would urge the applicants to look at both of them. What if you used a hawk light on the crosswalks? Those as well. Those have been helpful. I didn't hear what, what was the idea for the crosswalk. I just didn't hear the, 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 the hawk. The, 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 the oh, the lights. Okay, got it. Yes. Uh, Ms. Wong. Yeah, I'd just like to add in terms of the flow of traffic throughout Roslyn, we've got that school there that has active drop offs and pickups in the afternoon. And I don't know where the traffic flow goes, but certainly if parents are, you know, Wilson is one way, Clarendon is the other way. There's only so many ways you get back on the main roads and stuff. So I think that it might be worthwhile in your communications to include the school and find out what their sure. traffic flow, flow is like, because that's a major, they have like over 150 students or more going it's to the like HB Woodlawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also is, includes a program for the severely handicapped. Shriver School. Um, piggybacking off of what Commissioner Bagley had uh, stated about the communication, making sure that you know there is an active, um, vulnerable sort of for any concerns. You know, for hours, the, 
you know, there's some lucky person who gets to receive those communications <laughs> systems. You know, that's something that uh, I think goes a long way to the community feeling like they have a, a means of engaging, you know, which should be someone who understands at the necessary level, you know, the commitments have been made, you know, in meetings like this, because as Mr. Bagley said, you know, on the ground construction folks are not in these meetings and may not care. Um, any else on construction? Just one more. Let me expand my request to not just HB Woodlawn, but there's lots of school buses that take students everywhere from that might need to understand where the traffic flow is or isn't. Yeah. So with ATS, we can definitely yep. Um, okay. So we're going to move to the community benefits. Um, I will start. Uh, so I'm very excited to hear that we are um, looking at getting some mix of on-site affordable units. That is music to my ears and certainly something that uh, Planning Commission will, I think I can speak to Planning Commission in this regard, those who are not here, um, are very excited or will be very excited to to hear. I understand the details of that are still being worked out. The more information you can have kind of on the makeup of the units, sizes, you know, what have you, when you come to Planning Commission, it sounds like likely in June, the better. Um, you will be asked those questions, so have answers. Um, <laughs> in as far as the unit uh, makeup, um, larger unit, something where a family could reside, is obviously our, maybe not obviously, is strongly our preference. And that is something that, you know, as you're looking at your numbers, um, if it means fewer total number of units, but more bedrooms, that's something I would take into your calculation. So if you can trade us three, one bedrooms for, a two or three bedroom, that's, I think, something that would be positively received and has been on other projects as well. Um, community benefits, other stuff. Oh, parks. Anybody want to talk about the parks and the dogs and the what have you? Heard some feedback on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the, uh, I was wondering if there's any plans for like uh, pet waste disposal stations in, in the year, because we have some Kelowna Village and they get filled up and then there's going to be a lot more coming over. Um, so right now we have you know, stations where people can put the bags in and deposit. So that would really be an important thing. Have a few of those on site so they don't all come over. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Sometimes right. overfill and people will leave the they'll forget to leave the bag, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, certainly provide that. Yeah. I don't know where they'd be located at this point, but it's certainly something we can incorporate. Okay, great. Make sure you refill the baggies, like if they're gonna have a little baggie. One other item on the category of entertainment that's another that's other category. I'm gonna make an executive decision that we're gonna do community benefits and other together right now because it all kind of leads together at yeah. this point. So well, this have at it. Yeah, this came from Colonial Village Tree. They were concerned about the entertainment. There's a possibility, maybe looking ahead a little bit, but they have a lot of noise from roadside grill, from uh, outdoor music and all that. And they were wondering if in the future there could be other types of entertainment besides uh, music, because they have a lot of people coming down from Clarendon and it was really noisy. So they kind of gave me that input to bring up, bring your attention. Okay. So alternatives to music, there might be other things that. Yeah, that's what sound better. Yeah. Yeah. So we asked for that. We got some some places that ended up putting muffling in, which really cut back on the amount of noise that was coming from that establishment yeah. into the neighborhood. Is is it noise that's emanating from within the building? Probably both. Uh, yeah, I can hear sometimes. It doesn't matter that much, but I can sometimes hear the music across the street, but. Uh, they kind of brought it attention in the past. It's really been an issue. So probably both within and outside. New for future. I mean, this is going to be a new structure. So what are the standards versus like the existing building? Yeah. Um, we, can, we can look at what the STC rating would be. And yeah. But yeah, you might look, you might look at sushi rock in the places that we know that we've yeah. had to do it to and see what the thing is. Glass is glass. You open the door, then everything shot. It's your weakest link is your, yeah. your issue. I think part of it, there, 
part of the issue was just the types of entertainment they might get outside of music or other things that comedy, I don't know, or something. That <laughs> could be, you know, juggling. Right. Juggling, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Mimes. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 No, but thank you. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. Part, again, part of that might depend on who moves in there and what they want to oh, do. So yeah. structure, so there's a structure issue, but also yeah. with a restaurant I decide to do. So, oh, thanks for so I'll hand to you first, yeah. Commissioner Peterson, well, uh, Ms. Prowl. So my question was um, on behalf of Commissioner Guevara, who is mm -hmm. online but cannot speak. And she <laughs> just wanted she wanted to hear more about the um, affordable housing and the makeup, like the conversations you're having so far. Are you leaning one way or another for the on-site versus the nearby on-site, the AF contribution? Are you thinking mostly on-site? Yeah. So um, the... For the base contribution, I, the decision has not been made, uh, and it won't be made until much later, um, like prior to footing to grade permit, basically, so a couple of years from now. So who knows what the market's going to look like or anything. Um, but I will say um, something that has been a more on my side, at least, and unfortunately, I think this is a statutory thing. Arlington is really limited to what it can do for that base affordable housing contribution. The, the formula itself is spelled out in the code. And it is very punitive if you provide on-site units for the baseline. So naturally, most applicants are just stroking a check to AF, which there needs to be sort of an all of the above approach, right? Um, so I don't know which way you all are going to, where, where the market's going to be and what you guys are going to do. But I will tell you, past prologue, I think that it's probably more likely than not that there would be an on-site contribution for the base affordable. So then you go to the GLUP, you know, the second tier. So the GLUP, the up GLUP, uh, which is again about 3,200 gross square feet that has to be provided, that must be provided on site. What the makeup of that 3,200 square feet, we're just starting to trade numbers back and forth for staff. Like, is it one bedroom, two bedroom? What's the makeup of that? And then there's the third tier, which is the bonus, uh, the bonus density. So once you zap out, and I guess one of the conversation things is what are the recommendations as far as community benefits? parks and rec contribution, transportation contribution, and then the rest could go towards affordable housing. And time was up until the last few years that most land development applications would just also, you know, stroke a check for AHEP, but now there's an emphasis on on-site. So I would imagine that the bulk of our uh, community benefits package for the bonus density is going to be made up with on-site units. But again, I don't know what the I don't know what the breakdown is because we're just starting to trade those numbers. So it's going to be a mixture of onsite units and then the cash for you know. But again, you may not get the cash; you may find that it's more beneficial to do onsite units. Yeah. Not that helps. Oh, Thank you on behalf of Commissioner Giver. Okay, so Commissioner Bell and then oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Bell, then Mr. Stein, <laughs> then Ms. Wong. Okay. With that. I my quick comment. I'm really pleased because I get affordable to housing, and I hope there's a lot of it on site. One of the things we do know, living in Roslyn, you can lose a really big 13.5 million dollar worth of community benefits. I want to make sure that community benefits they provide stay community benefits. If you do the park, then there's real things you can see. You put real units in; they're real units. You do something that sort of nice if they can disappear you can say oh well we'll trade that for something else and the community loses we just lost an observation deck three blocks from one 13.5 million dollars they got over uh mr stein yes i would first of all uh we very much support on site absolutely affordable we've had since sitting through all of the negotiations that created the formula as an observer and it was we had a lot of problems with especially near and definitions that jay came up with but we really appreciate that and the, it's very exciting the introduction of affordable units into high schools this is not a existing residential development uh, so very strongly on site and it's a perfect opportunity to work out uh, 
good mix because it won't adversely affect any current residents. There's no one in this case. So that's great. And we very, very much, very much support it. Uh, the other thing, though, it, that I've heard a lot because I was at part of the original uh, the site plan that was passed before, and I heard a lot at that time about roadside growth, and everybody was very concerned about losing. I've heard even more. Uh, I've heard some questions recently about it, and concerns about losing it. I've heard even more about El Reticchio, actually. And I know that you mentioned that <laughs> You were talking and talking to a variety of people, but a lot of people very, very strongly about it. And uh, anything you can do to incorporate that, consider incorporating to that are certainly a big part of the community over many, many years. We haven't, yeah, we haven't had conversations with Bill Reducchio, you know, directly, and they haven't necessarily expressed an interest in staying on. Um, I think, you know, we're open to discussing, and we have had conversations with roadsides ownership. Um, it's just way too early to sort of start placing those retailers. And so, you know, we're, we're certainly open to having discussions with them and especially if the community appreciates, you know, having that restaurant in the neighborhood. Name the building after them. Roadside out there. Those folks who are particularly interested in the food being there. <laughs> <laughs> As well, I'm going to talk about the park. Okay. Okay. So, so um, I live on the other side of the park, and um, we have children in our neighborhood that want to use the park, but we can't because there's a lot of sometimes dog stuff mm -hmm. everywhere. And so, I do express a lot of concern that we're currently unable to find a relief area or any type of um, allowance for the additional burden that the dog waste is going to cost our community. Um, you know, on one side of the spectrum, if we did not allow new tenants with dogs, then we wouldn't be having this discussion to this to this particular angle. But since we are allowing dogs, um, there is a burden to be had and shared, at least amongst all of us in some way. So I'd like to know why is it, um, why can't we find room for a dog dog run and stuff within the property adult. I think when when we have done um, dog runs and dog relief areas in our projects in the past, there is a challenge with the odor. And so in a tight site like we've got here with with few and small outdoor spaces that we could possibly put it, it's difficult to find a space where the dogs can relieve themselves far enough away from any other amenity space, like like the courtyard, like the outdoor seating area on the rooftop. Getting the, the odors from the dog waste far enough away from any any human occupied space is just a big challenge. Shoot. Oh, like a chute? Exactly. <laughs> like a laundry chute. <laughs> So, so um, I know the Odyssey has a small relief area at the bottom of their driveway area. You guys have been to the Odyssey. It's not that big, but it seems to serve fairly well. Um, I, I guess you know if I'll just keep one. If you're going to introduce dogs, you gotta you gotta take some of the burden. That park already has yellow spots because of all the things and who spots because of all the things and and uh, you know understand it's part of the responsibility of the dog owner itself but you know if you're going to introduce dogs you gotta i think be responsible to do something about what the dog leaves make a pet for an unfriendly environment right don't rent them and this goes to the tree pit situation too we really do want the green we want yellowy you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, you have a percent of people who don't dogs, and 30, 40 percent. I don't know. You're going to get dogs. Oh, yeah, they're all across the street already. Yeah, we'll get close. I have the. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, I think the feedback has been taken. You know, we're yeah. going to look at specific, you know, 
um, waste disposal locations, and certainly I think multiple uh, repositories for that sort of thing. Um, as far as um, the park goes, I think we definitely heard strong feedback that you know there are some there's improvements that the park would benefit from, and not just from increased usage, um, but that there's you know a baseline of needs that the park has. Um, so I think that's something that should be strongly considered as you're looking at you know the community benefits package, and it is a refrain we've heard you know repeatedly, not just for this project, that wanting to see you know a level of the community benefits staying within the community that's going to be impacted most directly by the new project. So I think that's something that, you know, and that's for staff as well, that's something that, you know, I know it's two party dance, you know, what does the county say, you know, we need, what is the developer offering? And we need to make sure that, you know, we're seeing some of those benefits directly on the ground and the community where the change is happening. And I don't know that we've always done a great job of that. And that's something that I think that we, you know, Developers and staff can do a better job of sort of relaying, you know, through the powers that be. And ma'am, I just want to add, it's not just aesthetics, but it's also health related. Yes. Um, just to, I just want to level set a little bit about any contribution monetarily that will go towards the park. It wouldn't, our, talking with our DPR staff, it's not, they have no plan to do anything transparent live with the park so any money money that we get would be like beautification of the space it wouldn't be transforming it into a, a world-class facility or anything brand new so i just want to like level set in case that's oh, no and that's an important um information for us to have as well commissioner starley i'm gonna Frustrate you a little bit. I'm going to go back to sure. transportation for a quick comment. That actually does frustrate me. Why? Sorry. Are there any bus stops on this property? Like fronting or just uh, any bus stop. to the property? No. There's okay. I, I was just going to ask for bus shelters if there are any bus stops anywhere near the property. Thank you. That's good. That was fine. That's no, we're good. We're right. Um, that one. Yeah. It's going to be there's, floating. There's a floating bus stop on the north side of Wilson. Blocking north traffic. So let's make sure it's safe and it have a shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Anything else? Community benefits. We've sort of led into the other category. Would like you have something you want? To say? No, I'm good. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. Anything else? Um, so let's do a quick wrap up. A return. Yeah, this may have been covered at the last meeting. Okay, so I apologize. You referenced um, a green wall, um, but I didn't see any good pictures of it. Could you pull up that? Just because I think that's, um, you know, we have our Biophilic Cities Initiative that we signed on to in 2020, and um, would love to see, you know, how you're bringing, how you're supporting that effort in Arlington. And this is Great. all on the Clarendon Boulevard frontage in the vicinity of the stoops. So. Um, for reference, so here are the stoops that we we're looking at earlier, um, entering entering into those residential units. Just past the stoops, we've got a planter and grade that, that has opportunity for that vertical okay. wall component. And this is on with southern. So it'll be like vines crawling up the wall. We've got Jeff. Do you want to speak in a little more detail about? Well, yeah, the, the type of plant largely depends on the type of system that we employ. There are, as you know, those what amounts to a large lattice that mount directly to the building in which plants can climb up. That would be primarily vines. Uh, a better system, in our opinion, is one that has a little more soil involved within the structure of the green wall itself. It takes a little more maintenance. Um, it costs a little bit more, but uh, I think the survivability is better. And in that case, you can provide a, a a richer variety of plants that would survive year round. Um, the, the vines will certainly survive as well, but we're this is sort of a more limited palette. Um, we're fortunate that we do have uh, planters beneath each of those green walls to actually root the plants in soil. Uh, but 
Uh, again, you can do it vertically as well. Uh, and that's just, we're beginning to have those discussions with manufacturers about how we might incorporate those. Um, so uh, I, the simple answer is the type of planks largely depend on the type of system that we go with. Um, but in either case, we'll be able to find plants that are uh, native and that will survive or adapted and will survive well year round uh, in this climate. So. And the green walls will be maybe like four feet tall. Is that what I'm seeing in that bottom right? square like the sixth little box yeah so I, I we've we've had some images that we shared in the last presentation i don't think we have them readily. i'm gonna yeah. ask you to follow up with commissioner peterson directly then since okay. we didn't have this at the last meeting um i appreciate that we want to have you know fulsome discussions but um okay so i don't don't believe we have anyone signed up for public comment still, still true still true no no Okay, so at this point, I think we're going to move to a quick kind of wrap up. I'm going to look for final thoughts from those at the table. Um, the, the membership, not per se the applicant, but I guess you guys can give a final thought as well. Um, so we'll move through this and I'm going to try to get us out of here before nine. That's okay. Why not? And I still have to go home and submit a proposal. So there we go. Um, Ms. Wong, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, Thank, thank you for this opportunity to to talk and work with you all. I appreciate all the work that you must be doing. I'm an engineer. We balance requirements all the time with policy, and I understand. I appreciate. It. Thank you very much. Are you UVA grad? Uh, for for planning, yeah. I I've spoken enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I appreciate a lot of things that you. Uh, you're doing, and uh, the only thing that that I noticed in particular from previous discussions was, of course, the as far as the plan, everything is very good, but uh, it's important that the area, including Road Street, is considered a heart of things. It's, to sort of a bookend and a stop in any way. And the, the a little bit of extra height does contribute some of that. That's one thing that I, I see, but it's important that that's one of those centers is the parks, but also Road Street, if I remember, it's many years ago, it was considered very much the center. And I don't see as much of the elevations of the Road Street facade. I appreciate that you're going beyond the requirements for the sidewalk there, because I think it's very important that that street is also uh, remains a center community. Uh, well, thanks for the sun study. I, I'll share that with our folks there. So we appreciate that. But Mr. Peterson, uh, I like the building overall. Uh, I think the points that were made earlier about making sure that remain safe during construction are important. So, you know, mid block crossings, um, especially if there's that uh, floating bus stop um, on the north side, um, making sure that people can get off the bus there and cross safely to get to the. Uh, Mr. Armstrong. Yes. Um, I appreciate the, the going to eight feet for the sidewalk, the stoops. Um, I'd always like more, but uh, uh, thank you for that. And uh, uh, also during construction, how important it is to make sure that there is safe passage for pedestrians and bicyclists on the site. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think the project is great overall. It's always a good sign when we're talking about inches. You know, uh, it means we've hit some fundamentals <laughs> and we're no longer arguing about, like, why are you doing this? Um, so I really appreciate the project and I really appreciate the direction and the details and like the, the well thought out approach. I think we heard some important items tonight. I think there is still um, you know, some, obviously the construction phasing and how that's gonna work on site, that's going to be the more detail, the better when we're sort of at the point where we can kind of be sharing that information. I think to the extent you can have some answers on how you're thinking about keeping access to sidewalks and such open as we head into transportation committee um, and PC ahead of county board, that's gonna be important. Um, the on-site affordable, I think you're hearing a lot of really positive feedback on that, so that's great. Um, poor doggies need a place for their poop, so working that out, and we need to make sure that they're not further, you know, 
decimating this park that I guess I have to take my dog to at some point now because I'm still concerned. <laughs> He'll hold it, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, okay. I think we had a very productive conversation tonight. Um, I guess I could have saved my comments for last, but we'll just keep going back. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Beckley. Um, thank you for the updates and listening so far. I hope that you will take what we heard tonight so that when this comes in front of PC, that we see some updates and some answers to the questions that are submitted. It's a good project, which she said I agree with, but yet um, I'm happy to see the changes from the last iteration. Though, so as Commissioner Sarlow said, that this is we're talking about details. It's a solid project. Uh, yeah, great project, great changes. Um, I think the only thing I would add to my earlier comments is I really appreciate the background on why it is so challenging to get this area by the stoops um, to work. Um, so with that additional background, um, I do think um, it's sounding like narrowing the tree pit, but lengthening the tree pit to compensate does seem like a very reasonable way forward if the other options are really losing units or, um, or, or things of that ilk. So thank you. Um, before I go to the applicant, anyone on line who's a member of the uh, SPRC have a final thoughts? Yeah, I do. I think especially given the comments that Ms. Badger made about the uh, uh, DPR not doing any major renovations on that park, that's going to be a real important amenity for the residents of this building as well as the existing uh, neighbors. So I just think there's got to be a lot of emphasis on how to make that work well, uh, both for this project, but for the existing project, you know, for the existing housing is already there. So to to you know, whether it's a mini dog run or whatever it is, but I think there needs to be some creative thinking and it doesn't need to be a massive park overhaul, but there can be uh, some, you know, significant improvements done. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else uh, virtual? Okay. Uh, applicant, if you want. I, I, yeah, I will say um, I really appreciate it. Um, I have to say this has been a very uh, enjoyable, um, informative and thoughtful and efficient SPRC process. Um, but I really appreciate all the comments. We, we appreciate all the comments. Um, I think this does show that you know, we submitted a conceptual site plan, as I mentioned at the last meeting before we filed this. So we got a lot of good feedback handling a lot of the issues related to architecture and height and form and setbacks from the very beginning. And that is what informed our full formal process. And it shows that that conceptual site plan process Really, uh, does work. And I appreciate all of you all taking the time out of your schedules to come here. Thank you to the members of the Planning Commission um, that are not the SBRC co chairs for doing that. They don't have to do this, um, but it's really good and shows uh, good informed citizenry and um, good decision makers and policy makers. So thank you. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. We're efficient. Let's go home. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.